Welcome to the show. Find your balance. 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 I have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Lance Dotis. Now, he is a training and supervising analyst emeritus with the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and was assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He has been the director of the Substance Abuse Treatment Unit of Harvard's McLean Hospital, director of the Alcoholism Treatment Unit at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, which is now part of uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and uh, director of the Boston Center for Problem Gambling. For many years, he chaired the discussion group, The Psychology of Addiction, at the fall meeting of the American Psychoanalytic Association. He is the author or co-author of a number of journal articles and book chapters about addiction. His books, The Heart of Addiction, written in 2002, Breaking Addiction, a seven-step handbook for ending any addiction, written in 2011, and The Sober Truth, written in 2014, have been described as revolutionary advances in in understanding how addictions work. Dr. Dotis has been honored by the Division on Addictions at Harvard Medical School for distinguished contribution to the study and treatment of addictive behavior and has been elected a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. He has been invited to speak about treatment of addiction uh, at symposia all around the country. And thank you so much, Dr. Dotis, for joining my little show today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So you can now add to your very impressive resume that you've been on the Boost Health podcast. So you have to make an edit to that uh, directly after. (laughs) Just teasing. Um, So I read your book, The Heart of Addiction and The Sober Truth, and I was particularly moved by The Heart of Addiction, the seven step handbook. And it's funny because I like to listen to books on uh, Audible while I go for my evening walks. But this book was so good and it hit home for me so much that I had to I had to make sure I was sitting down and listen and take notes at the same time because it it was just perfect for what I needed. So um, (laughs) it just speaks to how good it was. Uh, so I have lots and lots of questions. Um, you're a really busy guy. We, ha- we have a limited time, so I'm just going to jump right into the questions here. Um, I think the biggest takeaway that I got from reading your books is that we are thinking about addiction completely wrong. Um, take alcohol uh, addiction, for example. The typical path of learning about alcohol- alcoholism, at least as I see it, is you know, somebody wonders, okay, am I drinking too much? And they Google it, you know, how much is drink, how much is too much? And, you know, the CDC says that 15 drinks for men or eight drinks for women um, or more per week is excessive. And so if a person's like, okay, a drink is five ounces of wine or 12 ounces of beer, they start doing the math and they're like, oh, gosh, I guess I'm drinking excessively. Does that mean I'm an alcoholic? Do I need to go to AA or rehab? And I think what might be surprising and interesting to people is to hear your definition of addiction and how it's much different than sort of the mainstream addiction propaganda. So can you share sort of your philosophy and definition of addiction? Sure. And the first thing to understand is that addic- there, the word addiction is used in two completely different ways. So, uh, and they're often confused. One way is to mean physical addiction. That is a property of your body is really not a property of the drug. So some drugs uh, produce a reaction so that we become uh, habituated to them. We don't react anymore when you take the same drug. So you have to increase the amount to get the same effect. That's physical addiction. And then when you withdraw the drug, once you're physically addicted, you have a reaction called a withdrawal reaction. That's physical addiction. It has absolutely nothing to do with addiction, with the other form of addiction. For example, you can take uh, anybody and physically addict them to alcohol. That's easy to do. Just have them drink uh, a lot for a week or so. Their bodies will be adapted and they'll be physically addicted. And then if you take them off it, are they now alcoholics? Of course not. It has nothing to do with the fact that you've had a physical addiction. So what addiction is really about is what makes you do it, not the drug. After all, there are lots of things that are addictions that don't even involve drugs, gambling, running, eating, lots of things like that. So the key is to understand the psychology of it. What drives people to do it? Why do they do it? Which is also a very helpful uh, way of thinking about it because that way you can figure out what's behind it and work it out and then you don't have to have the problem anymore. So that would be the short answer. If you, if you, uh, have, an, if you have an addiction or if you're not sure and you want to find out, 
the answer will be if you have to drink, not because you want to drink or you like to drink, but if you have to drink, especially at times of stress, that that's your solution, the chances are this is not social drinking anymore. This is something that you are doing to solve a problem. Right, right. I, in your book, one of the best examples you gave that just put a light off in my head was the example of Vietnam veterans being addicted, uh, quote unquote, to heroin, I believe it was. And you know, heroin in our society, like, oh, gosh, you think of, you know, somebody that's, you know, homeless and, you know, doing heroin on the side of the street and in really bad trouble. But your example that you gave was these Vietnam vets got hooked on heroin over in Vietnam and they came back and the, they got off for the most part, almost every single one of them didn't do heroin anymore because it was just, as you just said, it was a physical addiction. They didn't have any psychological dependence to it. And I was like, oh gosh, that makes so much sense. Sure, sure. And that was a famous study by a woman named Robbins out of uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, the other important part about that is that not only is physical addiction not important, it's not that it's not a real problem, of course it is, but that's not what addiction is about. But it, the other important part of that study is that it, it shows that the current thinking, the, the, the widespread idea that addiction is a brain disease, mm -hmm. something that was promulgated by some people at the National Institute of Drug Abuse, that's wrong, and that evidence shows it. The, uh, the brain disease idea is that if you drink enough, your brain changes. So you have a permanent change in your ability to respond to, let's say, alcohol. And so you will always crave the alcohol. You will not be able to stop using it forever. That's the brain disease idea. It's completely untrue. <laughs> if you look at the Vietnam study, all those people should have had a brain disease. There were tens of thousands of them who used heroin in Vietnam. They should have all had a brain disease and they shouldn't have been able to stop using. But they over 90% of them did. So it's not true. And there's plenty of other evidence against that idea, including the fact that there's absolutely no evidence in humans for it. There's, uh, the studies were done with rats. So it probably does, is true for rats. But for humans, that idea doesn't apply. Yeah, we have a little bit of a different brain than a rat does. <laughs> Much bigger. The rats brain is about the size of your thumbnail. Right. And, and you mentioned too, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not a disease, it's not a brain issue. And you also mentioned in your book that there's some research where they're trying to point to it being some sort of genetic trait issue, but you, you're saying that you're not seeing it as that either. Well, here's the problem with the genetics. If you, there's, there are genetic effects in almost everything without there being genetic illnesses. So one way, there's a lot of data, but I won't go into it, Lee, but if you look at people who have the same genes, identical twins, they have exactly the same genes. If one of them has alcoholism, the other one should. Right. In fact, the odds are the other one does not. There's a 60% chance, at least, that the other one does not have alcoholism. Exactly the same genes. So is, could there be any genetic factor? There's a genetic factor for almost everything. But it is not a genetic disease. And... Uh, Besides the twin evidence, there's a ton of other evidence uh, from uh, uh, other studies that show that it's not. So that's that's good news, unless you're using that as your, as your excuse that you've got a bad brain or bad genetics or some sort of disease. Sorry, folks, it's actually a psychological issue. Um, so when COVID hit, anyway, let oh, me sorry. say one thing. Yes, yeah. people don't like to hear that it's a psychological problem because they think it's an insult. Right. But let me let me say that. When I say it's a psychological, it's, it's not so much an issue, it's a solution. It's a symptom. That's all it is. And the next thing that's important to say is, if you are not ashamed to, uh, let's say, compulsively arrange things on your desk, if you have a compulsive behavior like that, or you have to keep everything neat, or you have to clean the house a lot, something like that, uh, that's a compulsion. It's a psychological symptom. Who cares? I mean, it's important to you, but it doesn't make you a bad person. Addictions are exactly the same as compulsions. Right. They're just they're just compulsions to do things that we call addictions. So if you're and and one of the reasons one of the pieces of evidence for this is that people switch between compulsions and addictions. One of the cases I wrote about in one of my books was a woman who uh, was uh, addictively using, I believe it was Procaine, one of the opiates, 
and she stopped using them, but then she couldn't stop herself from cleaning her house. Right. So she substituted one for the other. That's not unusual. For example, it's commonly seen in people going from drug addictions to gambling addiction, uh, which is, by the way, called compulsive gambling. So switching between what we call a compulsion and what we call an addiction just happens all the time because they're the same. And that's interesting, too, because, you know, one of those is a, a drug in one case and one of them is not a drug at all. So that that definitely shows that there's addiction can go between drug and non-drug transfer. Absolutely. Happens all the time. Yeah. And you brought up a good point, too. Like we, you know, saying it's not a psychological problem, that's a good point. And I'm still trying. I just read your book books a few months ago, but I still am trying to change the way I think about addiction and, and, and we call people addicts and that may, may, may not even be the best word just because people associate it with negativity. Right. right? I remember, um, I, when I started reading your books, I was so excited. I was telling everybody about it and I told my mom and, um, you know, I was like, mom, I'm, I'm, I've stopped drinking. I'm reading this really great book. It's really interesting about addiction and psychology. And she's like, oh, but you're not an addict. And I love you, mom. Um, she just, she is, again, that's like a lot of folks are associating addiction with somebody that's bad or wrong or doing something incorrectly, where most of us have some sort of psychological disorder, right? Or even, I, I'm not even crazy about the term disorder. It's, I mean, we all have a disorder. Then. Yeah. Everybody there I go again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just the symptom. And, uh, you know, a while ago, when people were first starting to recognize this, they used to have posters, maybe they still do, saying, this is the picture of an alcoholic. I don't know if you've ever seen it. They would have 25 pictures, and they all were just people. Yes. You know, there is no way of differentiating people with alcoholism from the general population. It doesn't mean anything about you any more than if you, as I said, if you were compulsively cleaning your house or compulsively exercising. Yeah, it's a symptom. That's it. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to look at it. I'm going to continue to try to re-educate myself and share your good word on that because that's so important. Um, what spurred all of this for me is when, when COVID-19 hit, um, I noticed I was under more stress as, as most of us were. And um, I was under different stress too with, with a bunch of other stuff, with work and stuff. We had just moved from Hong Kong back to the US. And, uh, and I noticed I was drinking more than I usually would. And I sort of just did a little uh, poll amongst my friends and on my Facebook page for my business. And it seemed like a lot of other people were also, at least at the beginning of COVID, uh, drinking more alcohol. This, I mean, addiction is a lot of different things. We're just specifically talking about alcohol here. In your practice, where you work with all different types of addiction, are you seeing more addictive behavior in general um, and or with alcohol since COVID? Well, this raises another, I think, important point. Uh, there's a difference between drinking a lot just to stay with alcohol and having an addiction. Again, leaving physical addiction aside. So uh, let's, we all, let me use an example. Let's say you're in an airport in the days when people used airports. Let's say you go to an airport. Now you've heard, you're waiting for your plane. You get a notice that it's five hours delay. And there's a bar there. You don't have alcohol, but you, you, there's a bar there. So you go over to the bar and you have a drink or maybe a couple of drinks. Is that alcoholism? Well, obviously not. You are you, you are doing something which will help you to get through that time. It doesn't mean it's a symptom. It's not a symptom. It's just that you're doing something that makes it in a certain crazy way a certain amount of sense at that point. In fact, it's just it's it's just like the soldiers in Vietnam. Why did they use heroin? Well, they were in Vietnam. Terrible experience. It was frightening. It was horrible in many ways. Their friends were dying. It was horrible. So in order to manage that feeling of, of being trapped in this situation, they used heroin. When they came back to the United States, they, didn't, they weren't in Vietnam, so they didn't need the heroin. So it was never addiction. Now, what's the difference between them and the people who really do have an addiction? Well, if, and there were a small percent, fewer than, nine, fewer than 10% of the, of the soldiers actually did continue. So why did they? Well, they may, be had, they may have had a, a, a true addiction. Their use of the drug was because they were solving an emotional problem. It wasn't an external problem. It wasn't because they were in Vietnam. But Vietnam was inside their heads, you might say. Right. So they were trying to resolve something. So uh, getting back to COVID-19, 
we are all are, are under a lot of stress because of that and, and other things. So I yes, you expect that there will be more depression. You expect that there will be more ways that people try to get out of this feeling overwhelmingly helpless, which we all feel, um, by doing something like that. But it's because of the external circumstances, not because we need to resolve a feeling of helplessness that's just coming from us. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. And I want to talk, you, your book, The Sober Truth, really opened a lot of eyes, I think, to folks about, you know, the success of AA and rehab centers, both. Um, you know, I had no idea. I just assumed some people go into those programs and have success and some people don't, but maybe it's because some people just aren't ready yet or whatever. But I had no idea. It's because they, they don't seem to be using actual principles, you know, psychotherapy principles uh, for addiction, right? Oh, not at all. That's crazy. <laughs> almost all of them, not as many as they used to be, but almost all of them are 12 step programs. And the 12 steps themselves are not psychologically uh, uh, involved. We all know what they what they are about it. It's a it's a uh, based on the idea that you should turn over your life to a higher power. You should cure yourself of your faults. I'm using their language, um, and that through this kind of faith in the system, or faith in God, or faith in your compatri compatriots, and by following these steps, you will form a cohesive group which will help you to not drink. That's that's how it works. So. The success rate of AA is between five and eight percent. So, of all the people who go to AA, only about five to eight percent become sober members. Uh, this is not widely known. Uh, so, that's not a surprise because the way it works, when it works well, it works like a grief group, for example. Grief groups are good things, they are supportive. You feel better because you have a community that cares about you and is, shares some of your concerns. That's what AA offers. But if that's not enough for you, which it isn't for over 90% of people, and why should it be? Because the problem has nothing to do with that. Then uh, you're not going to get better in AA. The rehabs also work on 12 steps. Uh, they generally tend to have not, not have well-qualified uh, therapists on their staff. They have al alcohol counselors who mostly know the 12 steps of AA, and that's about it. Uh, so their success rate is also awful, completely awful. In fact, they don't study it. There, was, there were early studies of it, and they stopped studying it because the results were terrible. So uh, what they now do is they compete with each other for luxury items. You know, <laughs> We have gourmet chefs, none of which has anything to do with addiction. And the problem with the rehabs is that they are extremely expensive, the famous ones. They can charge up to $90,000 a month. Uh, passages in Malibu charges $90,000. It's a complete waste of your money, uh, which you could better use to get qualified good help on the outside. Sometimes people need to go in, but that's usually just because their, situ their situation has deteriorated, they need a break. Nothing wrong with that. Right. But to spend 30 days there's nothing magical about 30 days, of course. To spend 30 days spending money that you need and is important to, to live your life and then come out and relapse, which almost everyone does, is, is terrible. So, well, folks should start by reading your books and understanding what addiction really is. And then I would say if they need more help, um, they actually need to go to a therapist like yourself who actually has been trained in addiction therapy, wouldn't you say? Yes, although uh, the bad news is that there are not too many of us. Uh, <laughs> That's just... And I, I feel it's, I'm sorry for, to say about my field, I know lots of people who are really fine therapists in every other way. But when it comes to addiction, they throw up their hands, they say, go to AA, mm. which is terrible. It's a, it's a kind of abandonment. So uh, I have through not only my books, but also academic papers and talking to groups around the country. I have done my best to try to let my colleagues know about how to do this, and lots of them do. But I would say if you are looking for a good therapist, uh, you, have to, you have to screen them. So even if somebody is otherwise a good therapist, I would ask them, if I have an addiction as part of my troubles, how are you going to treat that? Right. And if they say, well, 
go to see the addiction counselor. We'll talk about everything else. Stay away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. right. If they say, I'm going to integrate it, I'm, because it is integrated. It's just a symptom of what bothers you. So when you understand the things that are going on in your life that are really emotionally important, you will understand why you have the addiction. And if you understand this is where the addiction is useful in the therapy, every time you have the urge to do the addictive behavior, whether you do it or not, it almost doesn't matter. But when you have the thought of it, it's always preceded by something that's idiosyncratic to you. Some theme in your life that always makes you feel overwhelmingly helpless. So you can use the addictive feelings to learn about what's most, what you are most sensitive to. And you can learn, when you learn about yourself, you will also be able to predict when the addictive feelings will come on. So that's the sort of thing that you would hope a therapist would do. So, uh, you know, I would shop around, make sure that you have somebody, it would be nice if they knew my academic papers or read my books, but even if they didn't, if they are, as long as they are going to think about addiction as just another compulsive behavior that needs to be understood, then that's who I would pick. And you, you alluded to what I think you call the key moment, right? Where if you realize, you know, you're, you're not dependent on the drug physically, it's, uh, it's a psychological issue where you're, you know, maybe you have social anxiety or something like that. Every time you're in a social situation, you feel like you, you want to have whatever that addiction might be. Um, so sort of doing the introspective work and finding what you call, which is great, the, the key moment. Um, I think that's sort of the hard work and the real introspective work when you actually are thinking in your mind and doing the hard work and figuring out what are those things that trigger upstream um, the addictive behavior down the road. Right. And after you do, you know, it's hard to do with one episode, but mm. when people get used to doing this. Eventually, everyone sees that there is a theme to all the things that lead them to have to think of having a drink. Each individual episode is slightly different, but there's a theme. For example, um, uh, I often use this example when I'm describing, I haven't even talked about the, the way I understand addiction, but I often use this example of a man who was standing on a street corner waiting for his wife to come, became extremely frustrated. He had alcoholism, but he hadn't had a drink for six months. And he was so overwrought, he went into a bar and had a drink. So when I talked with him about it, um, I wanted to know when he felt started to feel better. And he first he started to say, well, I felt better at drinking. But then he thought about it and he said, you know, I actually felt better, started to feel better before I even had a drink when I ordered the drink. And then he thought some more, he said, you know, I think I started to feel better when I walked in the bar. And finally he pushed it all the way back in time. And he said, the moment that I really started to feel better was when I was standing on that corner and I decided to get a drink. Hmm. So that's the key moment, because the key moment is the point that you decide or that you first think about. So the advantage of identifying that is because now he can look back. The fact that he drank later and maybe the results of the drinking, that's really not so important. We're interested in the cause of it, not the results. So at that key moment, something had triggered him. It obviously was that he was waiting for his wife. But what we needed to understand was why that was so important. Well, he felt overwhelmingly helpless there. Mm -hmm. Because it's nothing, he, he, he was helpless in a certain way. What could he do? This is in the days before cell phones. He couldn't call his wife. He was stuck there waiting for her. So if he had many examples in his life where he thought of drinking or did drink, he would eventually discover that they all had some component of feeling overwhelmingly helpless and that it all had to do with the same kind of thing. Now I'll jump to the end with him. I'll tell you. He was a man who, when he was a child, he had two parents who they cared about him, but they both worked. And he was an only child. And he would come home from school, and he was a latchkey child. He had, he, the key was left under the mat for him when he came, when he walked home from elementary school. He opened the door, and he went in the house, and he had to wait for several hours in, in what seemed like an enormous and empty house, waiting for his parents to come home. Waiting for him was very important. Mm. It meant not being cared about, not being loved. It's just his experience as a child. It was an ongoing trauma for him. 
So fast forward 30 years, when he was standing on that street corner, he felt overwhelmed by having to wait, okay? So that's the kind of thing that he would eventually learn. And so in other circumstances where he felt similarly frustrated, it, they wouldn't all look exactly the same, but they would all trigger the same kind of emotional issue for him. He would know when he started to think about drinking, why it was that he was thinking about it. And even better, once he learned the theme, he could anticipate it. He would know that in certain circumstances that he was going to be in, exactly that kind of thing would be reawakened. This is before it even happens. So he would say, that's a time when I'm going to be at risk of drinking, which gives him a chance to do something about it. He's not overwhelmed. So I'll just be quick. I know I'm running over a little bit, but it's okay. I, I, just, want, I just want to get my other two points in. Yeah, please, please. So the first thing that we figured out was that the, the uh, purpose, you might say, for the symptom of addiction uh, is to reverse overwhelming helplessness. Like this man, he was helpless until he decided to get a drink. Once he decided, I mean, in reality, he was still helpless, but emotionally he wasn't helpless. He wanted to do something. He needed to do something in his own power to make himself feel better, and he did. So that's why... At that key moment, he felt relieved. He didn't even have any alcohol, but it was a relief to not be helpless. So that was the first part of my day. The second thing was, I said to him, by the way, can I curse on this podcast? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, because I'm going to quote him. Uh, the second thing is, I said to him, you've been trying hard to stay sober, and you've been doing a good job. So when you decided to drink, did you have a conflict inside of you? Did you say, I really need a drink. Oh, but I'm really trying not to have a drink. Oh, but I really need a drink. And he looked me right in the eye. He said, Doc, I'll tell you the truth. I said, fuck it, I'm going to have a drink. <laughs> yeah. And lots of people say those exact words. Right. Okay, so that tells us something. What did this mean, this curse? What, what, why did he say it? Well, he was angry. In fact, he was furious. He was so enraged. And it didn't matter that he had been working for all those months. It was overwhelming to him to have to do this. He was so outraged, he had to do something. So the second thing, and it would have to be a strong emotion to overcome his, you know, his intent to stay sober. So the second part of my idea is that the drive which makes addiction so powerful is the, a rage at helplessness. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to quickly add, this is not abnormal. It's actually, when you feel totally helpless, it's like you're caught in a cave, for example, and the cave is... The yeah, I love that example. Yeah. yeah. You're helpless. Right. So you just start screaming and you hitting the rocks and you can do anything. You might even break your wrist hitting the rocks, but no one is going to say you're self-destructive because you broke your wrist. Right. It's a normal, almost physiological reaction to be enraged when you're totally helpless. But that gives to addiction the things that we most identify with addiction. The intensity, the insistence, the, the lack of reason. You, know, you can talk to people all day and say, you know, you shouldn't do this. And they believe it, but they're going to do it anyway. So it's that kind of rage and helplessness. The third thing, this is my last thing. The man on the, so we understood the purpose of his drinking. We understood why he drank, why he was overwhelmed, why he had to drink. The helplessness and the rage of helplessness. But there was one more question. Why did he drink, though? What about the drinking itself? Why did he have to go drink? Okay, well, to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. He, I said he was helpless, right? Because he, he, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, have contact his wife. But was he helpless? Actually, he wasn't. He could have left, right? He could have said, well, the heck with her. I'm going to go get in the car and drive home. I'm not waiting for her. Now, he didn't do it for very good reasons. He didn't want to abandon her. He didn't want to terrify her. He wasn't there. He had lots of reasons for that. He loved her. But the fact is he could have. So I'm only saying that because he could have taken a direct action. Right? I'm not encouraging, but he could have. So when people do something that is a substitute, he would have been no longer helpless if he had just driven home. But when people do a substitute action to not be helpless, that's what we call the addiction. Right. And the technical term for it is displacement. 
So he displaces. Instead of doing this, he does that. And that is the addiction. So if he goes and has a drink, he displaces the need to reverse his helplessness to drinking. But let's say instead of having a drink, let's say he had gone into a, uh, a sports bar and placed a bet because he was a compulsive gambler. Well, exactly the same issue, right? But for him, the displacement was to place a bet. For someone else, the displacement might be to, um, uh, might be a sexual activity. There are lots of kinds of folks, foci, on these different addictions, and they're all the same, even though people have separated out the drugs, which, which doesn't make any sense. So that's the whole thing in a nutshell. Yeah, I, real quick, I, I know you need to go, but I think it's so interesting. I want to make sure people honed in on this. The gentleman you were just giving the example of, he felt better when he was just thinking about going to get a, get a drink. I think that's so interesting. I think that shows you the difference between the psychological and the, the physical. It's almost like we need a separate definition for physical addiction and psychological addiction. <laughs> Maybe that would help. Absolutely. The fact that we use the word addiction for both is a terrible problem. Yes, yes. Uh, so if we could try to avoid it by using the word dependence for the physical. We can say you're physically dependent. That's fine. And reserve addiction for what is really addictive. But it's too late to change. It. Yeah, it's too many years. And then the last thing with that gentleman, just to sort of leave on a good note, I know he was a client of yours. You know, his short term strategies were obviously to find out what that key moment was, which for him was having to feeling uh, helpless when he had to, when he had to wait in situations it sounded like. And the short term solutions are things that you can actually do. In his case, I'm not recommending he would have left, but let's use him as an example. For him, if he had understood all this, next time he was on the street corner, he might have said, okay, I'm feeling helpless again, I know why, but I still feel helpless. So I do need to do something. It's important that I do something to not feel helpless. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he had lots of choices. For example, he didn't. He was a guy who didn't tend to uh, get into arguments with his wife. He tended to say, "Okay, you know, you're you're late. I can't do anything about it." But he could have composed a little speech to give her <laughs> about how angry he was. He could have. He could have uh, uh, made up his mind to say to her, "Okay, here's what I'm going to do next time." I don't ever want to have to wait for you again. Whatever. You know, he could have done something like that. He could have planned ahead in another way. He could have said, I'm never going to be in this position again because I'm going to change my schedule. I'm not going to things like this with her. She's never going to go off and go shopping. Like her. Whatever. Yeah. That's a short-term solution. He finds another way. And people, there are always other things you can do. Um, of course, in the end, for some people, it's enough to just have it understood it so they don't feel helpless because they know what's going on. So that's the short term. The long term is you work it out. You get into a good therapy. And for him, it would have been, and it was, over time to work out his strong feelings about having been abandoned as a child. So that's a longer term solution. When he got that result, he didn't feel so helpless in that kind of situation anymore. That's amazing. I mean, that it's it's so empowering, isn't it? I mean, yes, you know, he needed to come and talk to you and he needed to understand the psychology behind it. But after that, you know, he's empowered. Like he recognizes the situations where he feels hopeless. And he can share that with, you know, some of the close people in his lives to maybe help him avoid those situations. But I mean, instead of a situation like AA, where you're told that there's no hope, you know, you're a slave to this addiction, whatever it might be for the rest of your life, your strategy and philosophy is there's hope. Like I can be empowered here. I'm not a slave to this. Once I recognize the things that trigger it, I, I can be in control. And that's for me. And that's the way I've been my whole life. Like it's all about control. If I can have control of situations, it, it really helps a lot. So thank you, Dr. Dotis. I know you've got to run. You're a busy man <laughs> and you took time out of your schedule to share your expertise with us. Thank you so much for your time. Where should everybody go to learn more about your books, to buy your books? I know they're on Amazon and, and Audible. You've got a website too. Yeah, well, there are two ways. I mean, I have a website, which is, uh, I think it's now called Dr. Dr. Lance Dotis, Dr. Lance Dotis dot um, I believe that's right. I'll put the uh, link to your website and to all your books okay. in the uh, show notes and uh, the video cast notes, but uh, please. Yeah, and the books are all available on uh, Kindle or paperback and audio and that sort of thing. Um, and, they, so, and they're all on Amazon. So if you look up uh, 
you can look up my name or you can just remember that it's, the first book is called The Heart of Addiction, H-E-A-R-T, The Heart. The second one is called Breaking Addiction and the third one is called The Sober Truth. Anyway, so I hope they're helpful. Well, they were so helpful for me. I really recommend everybody read them, even if you don't personally have an addiction, if you want to learn more about the true addiction and, uh, and, and maybe help some other folks uh, in, in their lives. So thank you again so much for your time and for sharing your expertise, Dr. Dose. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.